our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence in the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Thank you, Holy Father, for gathering your dear children once again this morning, that we can come before your holy presence to be taught by you. As you taught them wonderfully and powerfully in the morning session, we pray that once again you will teach us. Because you said, Lord, that you will gather your remnants in this place, in this Lancaster, where they can be taught by you, where you will teach them, make your ways known to them, and restore them to their fullest destiny, and also crown them with your goodness, and empower them with your mighty spirit in spirit, soul, and body. And also to be transformed by your majestic grace. For such a purpose, you have gathered them here, Lord. And all those who are watching online and through satellite television, I ask you now, to open the eyes of their understanding. Give them an understanding heart and a listening ear that they may hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the churches in these last days. In the name of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And please be seated. I hope you all had a great sleep last night. <laughs> did you? Yes. Wonderful. Which means you did not pray. <laughs> See, I caught you. <laughs> if you had a peaceful sleep, it means that you did not pray. <laughs> See? If you had travailed, you could not have slept. But nevertheless, God is our good God. Yes. I'm sure you prayed. Yes. Because you prayed, you slept well. Yes. Amen. Amen. See how kind-hearted I am. <laughs> Are you ready? Yes. What I'm going to share with you this morning is a two-part message. Part one will be this morning and part two will be tomorrow. Last month, or not last month, early this month, the first week of this month, the Lord called me to fast for seven days. He said, come and sit with me. I want to talk with you. And I know whenever the Lord calls me for such extended fast, besides my regular days of fastings, I know he has something very important to communicate some revelations for the church or sometimes something personal for me but usually it will be something that is largely for the body of Christ to prepare them for what is to come and to make the ways of God known so from the 1st of August to the 7th of August I was waiting before God and on the 2nd of August as I was meditating the scriptures on at, at about 10 o'clock at night, I heard the Lord Jesus say, Do you want to come to my house? You know, if the Lord Jesus asks you a question like that, who would want to say, No, I don't think so? <laughs> would you? No. no. And neither would we say, Lord, I'm too tired today. Let me come tomorrow. Would you say that? No. Neither would we say, Oh Lord, it's already late. Can we do it tomorrow at a more convenient time? We wouldn't say that, right? None of us in our right mind would say that because this is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity you don't want to miss. You never know whether you'll get a second chance or not. So when you do not know, perhaps that will be. But if you do not know, why miss this opportunity? 
Am I right? So, I said, yes, Lord. And the very next instant, I found my soul before the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, as soon as he saw me, he said, come. So I, I went near to the Lord and I noticed a large ivory box, like a chest. It was before, below the bottom of the throne of the Lord. And he opened the chest and I saw many scrolls in it. And among the many, he picked one scroll. And he said, look. And when it opened, or before it opened there, on the scroll was written the word, book, or the title, book of mysteries. And then when he unfurled the scroll, he unfurled it to a section called, the last day's mysteries. The mysteries that belong to the last days. If you read Revelation chapter 10 verse 7, it says there, that when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, the mysteries of God will be made manifest. Now we are living in that time. That is why God is making his many mysteries known to the body of Christ. Now why does he make that known to us? Because before the bride can be raptured, she must grow to the full stature and the full measure like the Lord Jesus. If you read Luke chapter 3, it says that when the Lord Jesus as a 12-year-old boy came back from Jerusalem, it says that he grew in wisdom and he grew in stature. Two kinds of growth, physical growth as well as in wisdom. So as growing in wisdom, and grew in stature. And now Ephesians chapter 4 tells us, we must all come to the full stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, full knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So similar to how the Lord Jesus grew. Full in wisdom and full in stature. So that being the case, before the bride can be raptured, now the Lord is releasing all those mysteries and the wisdom kept hidden from the ages so that the bride can be full of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So this is number one. Number two, the book of Revelation is not written in a chronological order. Chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. It's written like that for our understanding However, the events that are mentioned there are not written in a chronological order, which means the events of chapter 4 will not necessarily take place after the events in chapter 3, not in those order. So we, many, many theologians and Bible scholars go in error interpreting the book of Revelation because they think the book of Revelation is written in that chronological order. So they interpret it in such, okay, these events will take place, that event, not even uh, the, um, uh, the evangelical leaders, but even Pentecostal leaders. For example, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, where it is written, John hearing the Lord Jesus say, come up. So that many Pentecostal teachers interpret to mean the rapture of the church. That this is the rapture of the church has already taken place. Why? Well, now, the reason is like this. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, the Lord Jesus talks about the seven churches. And then from chapter 4 onwards, there's never a word mentioned about a church. So therefore, the logical interpretation is, when John was caught up, the church was caught up. But John is not the church. Right? He is a prophet there. If John was the church, then why talk about the seven churches in Revelation? So, 
when the Lord Jesus spoke about the seven churches in Revelation, those seven churches literally existed at his time. So the seven churches existed, so did John. Both existed at the same time. So if John was caught up, those churches should also be caught up. So the rapture should have taken place in the first century, isn't it? That is not so. So the apostle John had a powerful experience to be caught up to heaven, to see the wonders of heaven, so that he can write to us, telling us things that must shortly come to pass. You look at things from heaven's perspective. What is taking place in heaven? This is what the last day's remnant will be privileged to know. This is where God, God is calling you to rise up to that destiny. What you read in the book of Revelation, the experiences that the Apostle John had, every one of us here can have the same experiences. Do you believe them? Yes. Every one of us can. And we must pay the same price. That's the cardinal qualification. Not only the price, but that amount of consecration. That is one of the key themes of Brother Jeremiah Johnson. Right? These past three sessions that he spoke, his chief theme, if you notice, is consecration. Consecration is the after effect of repentance. So when you repent, you consecrate yourselves afresh to God. So the degree of consecration. Number three, qualification, surrender. You totally surrender. When you surrender, that surrender must be without any strings attached. This is our problem. When we make a surrender to the Lord, we have strings attached. Lord, I'll surrender, but, buts. We put many buts there. And our surrender is not a total surrender. It's 10% surrender or 20% surrender. Unless and until there is a 100% surrender, then it is counted as truly consecrated. If there is no 100% surrender, then you are not consecrated. We are not truly consecrated. We are not truly consecrated and set apart for the master's use. You know the very word set apart, it means it cannot be used for any other purpose. And that translates to mean, if you are set apart for God, the you, you, does not exist. See, you already set apart. So you cannot be used for any other purpose. Meaning, yourself does not exist anymore. To satisfy the self, the pleasures of the self, the pleasures of things pertaining to the flesh, must be all crucified. It doesn't exist. We must come to that level. Of course, it's absolutely possible. At the same time, we cannot deny the fact that it takes time. The degree, upon the degree of your consecration, then the grace will begin to increase in your life. On the first night, I shared with you about Brother A. A. Allen. Remember? Yes. That God had him, that he really sought God, and then he had a powerful ministry after that. But I purposely left, up, left aside one important part of his encounter. In the encounter, the Lord Jesus appeared as a ball of light before him and spoke to him of 11 things. Or 13. 13 things that are a stumbling block in his life that 
is preventing him from a total consecration. So the Lord told him, the day that you get rid of all the 13, that's the day. The fullness of the spirit will manifest in your life. So he wrote down all the 13 points on a piece of paper. And the last two were very, very personal to him. So he did not even share that with his wife. Absolutely too personal. So he erased them from the note that he had written. And he eventually wrote a book called Greater Power to the... Nice. No, sorry, tomorrow I'll tell you the name of the book. Okay? <laughs> I, I, I forgot. But it's available for free on the internet. So you can go and download. If I'm too kind, I'll give you the link to where you can download. Okay? <laughs> it's the price. Huh? The price of ah, the price of God's miracle working power. The price of God's miracle working power. If you just Google it, thank God for Google, you know. And you'll you'll find links and then you can find free download. So just click the free download and you can have it and you can read it. So now the point is this. So those 11 points that the Lord spoke to him, which are general for everybody, based on scriptures. That's why he wrote a book on it. So each time he overcomes one, he'll just tick. Tick on the list. Eventually he reached the bottom of the list, all 13. When all 13 were tick, he was truly consecrated. Truly consecrated. It was after that, he saw the fullness of the power of the Spirit manifest in his life. So that's the key. So the fullness of the Spirit comes in totally yielded. That's point number four. Yielding. Totally yielding. Yielding to the Lord. So, in a nutshell, what those four points means is this. You die. Simple, isn't it? You die. Because the dead knows nothing. Have you been to funerals? I'm sure you do. Have you walked past by the coffin? And you see the dead person in the coffin? Does the dead person ever keep an account of who came, who didn't come? No, they don't even care who came or who did not come. They don't mark attendance, do they? No. The dead knows nothing. We must come to that state of dying where it, it doesn't matter anymore. Your reputation doesn't matter anymore. You are totally dead. So your own will your own desires, your own ways don't matter anymore. This we find personified in the life of the Lord Jesus. Though being God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Meaning, when he was not equated with God, it didn't bother him. It didn't bother him. He emptied himself of all that. Not only put away divinity, you know. Even the thought of divinity, he put it away. Now this thinking is a great enemy we must control. We must overcome. Because externally, you may be humble. But your heart may not be humble. Your mind may not be humble. Your mind will desire to be recognized, but externally you may be pretending, okay, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Have you experienced that? Yes. It doesn't matter, but your heart and your mind will be thinking, oh my, they did not recognize me. <laughs> See? This mind. This is what it means in Philippians 2, 6. He thought it not robbery. See, thought it not robbery. Thought it thinking. Even the thinking 
must die. Your thought life must die. Be crucified. This enemy, you must crucify it. Never ever, even the slightest moment of feeling, looking at self, I am insulted. I am ill spoken of. The moment you try to look at yourself, then you will know that the I is still alive. Then you want to kill it. You want to crucify it. We must come to the state where you are dead. Whatever people want to criticize you, speak about you, praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to the Most High God. It's not easy, but you can get there. You can get there. For that, we, we all need the anointing of a duck. <laughs> you have never heard of that anointing? Oh, you poor thing. You want to know? Yes. Very simple. What is the anointing of the duck? Have you heard of this proverb that says, like water on a duck's back? Uh, that's the anointing of the duck. Water does not stay on a duck's back, right? It just flows away. So that's that anointing. Don't let anything stay on you. Let it just flow away. Let it flow away. Now listen. Not only negativism, the worst is positivism. Not only people criticizing you, but the worst enemy is people praising you. That is the worst enemy. Worse than criticism. Because criticism brings you down. Praise puffs you up. So, have the anointing of a duck. Amen. See what a powerful animal duck is. So, remember this. God in his great goodness is revealing himself so that the bride of Christ can come to a full maturity. And like I said yesterday, last night, we should not just be hearers of the word. We must become doers, practitioners. Only then you can go from glory to glory. If you are just hearers, then it does you no good. It is my desire. It's not only my desire, it's the desire of God. That all the saints who come here, should be transformed into the full stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, there are many prophecies spoken over Lancaster. Not only it will be a city of refuge, but also an oasis. An oasis during the end times. You know the natural definition of an oasis, right? But Spiritually speaking, even during the end times, when there is a famine for the word, but in this place of oasis, you will find the word. In this place, there will be abundance. So that is why the remnant who are gathered must become transformed. Must become transformed. How you are, in 2019, should not how you should be in 2020. You must have grown one step higher. Amen. When a little kid goes to school, he, he joins in grade 1. The following year, he goes to grade 2. Have you seen any kid for 10 years is still in grade 1? No. If he's still in grade 1, something's wrong with him. Right? You should progress from grade 1 to 10 and then 12 and then to college and then to all the various degrees that are possible. Progress. So we should progress. Amen. Amen. So when this book of mysteries were opened, so I saw this section. 
the last days mysteries. Among the many mysteries of the last days, one particular mystery that was shown to me was Mystery Babylon. That's, that's the section I saw, Mystery Babylon. And the Lord then began to speak to me about Mystery Babylon. You know, there are two parts to the subject of Mystery Babylon. And there are two chapters devoted to this subject in the book of Revelation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, an entire chapter was devoted to the speaking in unknown tongues. In the book of James chapter 3, an entire chapter was devoted to the natural tongue. So whenever one entire chapter is devoted to one particular subject, you must understand the great importance of it for the apostles to talk a great deal on that subject. And then in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, an entire two chapters, one long sermon was given by the Lord Jesus Christ before, one week before his crucifixion about the end times. One long, two long chapters. So we want to pay attention to those things. And then in Matthew chapter 23, one entire chapter, he rebukes the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the church leaders of today. One entire chapter given to them. You want to read what are the rebukes so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. So in Revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18, two entire chapters were written specifically about Mystery Babylon. Why two entire chapters? If not, that this is a very important thing in the last days. So please take note of that. This is something of great significance and importance in these last days. Mystery Babylon. Revelation chapter 17 verse 5 is where you will find the word Mystery Babylon being mentioned. And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. When the Apostle John was taken in the spirit to a wilderness, and he saw this woman, and on her forehead, he saw all these names that were written about her. Now you all know very well that names convey character. It's not just a name. It conveys a character. Like Abraham, father of nations. Sarah, mother of nations. Jesus, the one who saves so the names signify their characters. Similarly, now all these names, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Hollers, Abominations of the Earth, those are the four characteristics about this Babylon. So is it Babylon is a literal Babylon? as well as spiritual. This morning, I will share with you about the literal Babylon. And then tomorrow, we'll look at the spiritual Babylon, the spirit behind Babylon. In everything, there is a spirit behind it, both good and bad. There's a spirit that works it. It's not just an external working. Why are gay people just simply gays? How can someone signify, all my life I thought I was a gay? Why do they, have you heard people say that? How could they suddenly say like that? Recently I read in the news, a mother came out and made a declaration for her two boys. One was eight and the other was nine and she said, I want to declare to the whole world that my two sons are transgenders. 
how did an 8 year old boy and 9 year old boy know they are transgenders and the mother is making that declaration and in Sweden there is a law national law that you cannot force your children to be a male or female let them discover themselves they may be a male today but along the way they may want to be a female so as a result the law encourages every family to cross dress their children one day they are dressed as a male another day they are dressed as a female and then another day cross dress so as the children grow up they don't grow up knowing who they are they grow up confused am i right totally confused and they become like zombies can you imagine your little kids from two years old you cross dress them the boy your your son or your grandson you are calling him michael 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 or boy 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 and then you dress him like a girl so this little boy will be thinking who am i a boy or a girl so he'll grow up you know what is this what what screwed up in his mind <laughs> that's not an offensive what is it no okay not crazy just screwed up in the mind and there is a spirit behind that it's a spirit a spirit that promotes gayism a spirit that promotes lesbianism a spirit that promotes transgenderism that makes them feel like that it's a spirit that inside them that gives them those tendencies against nature this is what you'll find in romans chapter 1 that against nature a man goes after man a woman goes after a woman you never find any animal doing that you know have you no they have better sense right when the time comes for them to mate the male will look for a female but here man who is supposed to be the highest of God's creation is going against the order of nature and the laws of the land tells you that's okay so there's a spirit behind all this so what is Babylon Babylon plays an important role in the last days in relationship to end time prophecies so as much as Jerusalem is going to be very important the church so is going to be Babylon a trinity remember these three Jerusalem church Babylon let us consider a few facts Babylon, the word Babylon is mentioned more than 280 times in the Bible. Number two, the book of Revelation contains 404 verses. Out of the 404 verses, 44 are specifically written about Babylon. So which is 11%. 11% of the entire book of Revelation has talks about Babylon. So 1% is important enough, but here you have 11%. Number three, next to Jerusalem, the city of Babylon is the second most mentioned city in the whole Bible. A tale of two cities. Number four, Jerusalem means a city of peace while Babylon means a city of confusion and war see perfect opposite to what Jerusalem is in Revelation chapter 21 verses 2 to 3 Jerusalem is portrayed as a city of God whereas in Revelation chapter 18 verse 2 Babylon is portrayed as a demonic city. 
Jerusalem is a place where God dwells and Babylon is where demons dwell. You know, that can refer to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. After the war in the heavens, Michael and his angels got victory over the devil and his angels and the devil and his angels were cast down to earth. So when they were cast down to the earth, they come to inhabit Babylon. Already made ready for them. Babylon becomes a city full of demons. Now God's temple was built in Jerusalem. Whereas the altar for Satan was built in the ancient city called Shinar in ancient Babylon. Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 to 10 tells us that New Jerusalem was called or is called the chaste bride of Christ. Whereas Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 and 3 calls the new Babylon a great prostitute. Again, two opposites. In Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 4, New Jerusalem is called an eternal city. And you know the word eternal means forever. Whereas in Revelation chapter 18 verse 8, the scripture says that this new Babylon or the last days Babylon will eventually be destroyed at the coming of the Lord Jesus or before the coming of the Lord Jesus. So to summarize these facts, as it was in the past, when there was an ancient Babylon, so will there be a new Babylon in these last days. Do you know that before the US invaded Iraq, President Saddam Hussein considered himself as the reincarnation of Nebuchadnezzar and he proclaimed that it was his destiny to rebuild Babylon. So in the ancient ruins of Babylon, he began to build the same old city, the same palace that Nebuchadnezzar had made. He even had bricks made with his name Saddam Hussein on one side and on another side is Nebuchadnezzar. If you go to Iraq today and you can go and visit Babylon, the city of Babylon, the entire ruins of where the Babylon was has now turned into a tourist site. And you can just walk down, I've been there twice. So what I am saying to you, I am an eyewitness to that. And you can go to the palace, the half-built palace, incomplete palace of Nebuchadnezzar tried to build. The bricks all has his names there. Now, Saddam Hussein wanted to restore the old glory of Babylon, but it was not the right time. So he was taken out. He was taken out. And he, it was not the right time. Secondly, he was not the right person to rebuild Babylon. That is the call given to the Antichrist. He will come to do that. Not Nebuchadnezzar. So that is why he was removed so that he could not preempt the seasons and the times that God has kept in his hands. Even the good and the bad in the world, remember this, the seasons and the times are in the hands of God. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 40 to 42, the prophet Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar that it's God who appoints kings and it's God who pulls down kingdoms. It's God who does all that. He is the one who appoints kings. He is the one who appoints governments. He, not the public who cast their ballot vote. You all know too well that during the past election, presidential election, 
all the polls showed that Mrs. Clinton will win the election. Am I right? Even on the day of the election, till midday, the results all pointed to Hillary winning the election. They were about to celebrate when suddenly there was a turn. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, even Mr. Trump thought he has lost. Right? Suddenly, that suddenly is not Russia, you know. Not Russia. It's the finger of God. Amen. Finger of God. Because heaven had determined that Mr. Trump will be the next president. God had already determined that. So the people in the world, their hearts were all turned. It was God who turned the hearts. Now go and cast your words for Mr. Trump. Sudden turnaround that took place at midday. So it's God who appoints kings. It's God who appoints governments. So the seasons and the times are in the hands of God. Sometimes we don't understand why these things are happening. How can God appoint a communist government? If it is God who appoints, then it also means, did God appoint the communist government who is torturing the Christians? We can ask a valid question like that. Do you know, in 1959, when China invaded Tibet and took possession of Tibet, 100 Tibetan refugees or Tibetans left Tibet and became refugees in India. So was the Dalai Lama. So till today they cry over their lost city, their lost nation, and we feel so sad that all this mess has taken place, a poor people have been displaced and all that. But do you know, because of the communists, when they invaded Tibet, they destroyed 6,000 Tibetan monasteries, which were heavens for evil. They were destroyed. Number two, the hundreds and thousands, if not millions of monks, were sent back as farmers. They were re-educated, retrained to become ordinary farmers. If not, if Tibet had existed till today, as how it was originally, every Westerner would have flocked to Tibet and become Buddhist and brought back tantric Buddhism and filled the whole of Europe and the whole of North America. Tantric Buddhism is different from the Buddhism that Buddha founded. Tantric Buddhism is a mixture of Buddhist teachings plus demon worship. It's a mixture. They worship demons, they worship magic, mystery, they practice divination, they practice soothsaying. All that is a mixture of Tantric Buddhism which was the chief religion in Tibet in the early years. Now, then we fast forward back to the present times. In 1984, the Chinese government reopened the nation of Tibet to the outside world. From 1959 to 1983, no outsiders were allowed to enter into Tibet. They were banned. But in 84, the government opened the doors and let tourists come in. As soon as they opened the door, there was a great influx of Western tourists into Tibet. Every day, now this is the statistics, every day there were 8,000 Westerners who visited Tibet. And the reason why they come to Tibet is not to see how good the country is, but to learn Buddhism. I personally met three Westerners during my first trip to Tibet. One woman from Spain, one guy from Germany, and one guy from Belgium. We, we were traveling together from 
New Delhi in India to Nepal and then from Nepal to Tibet. And I asked them, why are you going to Tibet? And every one of them said, we want to learn Buddhism. Can you imagine every day, not a month or a year, each day, 8,000 Westerners were flocking into Tibet. So what did God do? He turned the heart of the communist government and in 1989, Tibet was close. Close to outside travelers. So no Westerners can go in again. Close. From 1989 right up to 1992. So when 1992, when the country was reopened again, but it was reopened with limited travel, which means backpackers not welcome. You must go in an organized tour, 10 in a group. So who want to pay big money to go? So that cost tourists to go down. See, it's God is in control. The next thing is, during this period of communist rule, people discovered that communism is empty. The church in China grew many times more during the communist regime than they were before. So you see, even an evil king or an evil government is an instrument in the hands of God. So all we have to do is submit to the goodness of God, to the wisdom of God, He knows best. And pray for your government. That's our duty. To pray for the government, whether you like or you don't like. It doesn't matter who comes to office. Uh, Christians are good. Bible-believing Christians' duty is to pray for the government. Pray for the king. Pray for the president. Pray for the prime minister. Pray for all the ministers and secretaries that work together with the leader so that we can live peaceful lives. See, this is God's counsel for us. Now some historical facts about Babylon. Now, the reason why I'm giving you this information is because what happened in the past is going to be repeated again in the future. So in order to know the future, we need to look at the past. This was how Babylon was in the past. This is how she will become again in the future. Number one, ancient Babylon was situated in a plain called Shinar. Genesis chapter 10 verse 10. Now where is Shinar? Shinar is situate, situated by the banks of the Euphrates river which is 50 miles south of Baghdad. So it is a beautiful one hour drive by car that you go past by all the nice cities of Iraq and you eventually reach the ancient city of Babylon. When you step foot at the gates of Babylon, you are transported back 3,000 years. Whatever your eyes will see in that place are 3,000 years old. So back to the future. There's similarity, no? There's a car in that movie and you take a car in the real. Same. Number three. Old ancient Babylon was an important commercial and trade center. It was a bustling, bustling commercial center like New York, London, France, Paris, all those important cities. By the way, New York is not Babylon. Many preachers preach like that. They have, New York is Babylon or America is Babylon. No. They are not, it is not Babylon. Babylon will be Babylon. Number four. It was a powerful kingdom during the years 1792 to 1750 BC. Number five. It was a 
powerful military nation militarily very powerful and in 597 babylon conquered jerusalem second kings chapter 24 verse 10 now god allowed jerusalem to be conquered because of their sins and god said i will use the babylonians to discipline you and humble you now here you you have a direct scriptural evidence that god uses nations to discipline other nations and to subdue other nations is the hand of god similar to what i just told you about china and tibet in the same manner during the communist regime in china the christians became very strong and bold during seasons of persecution they were made very strong very bold and so are the christians in russia now russia mr mr putin has enacted new laws now they are going back to the cold days of once again persecution for christians after the fall of communism there was a respite days of respite for the christians in russia now they are going back to the old days presently no foreigner foreign christian preacher is allowed to enter russia you can go as a tourist but you are not allowed to preach in any church even in a church not allowed you are not allowed to visit any christians you are not allowed to give any tracts you are not allowed to do any of these religious things and for the russian christians they can worship in their own homes or in their officially designated churches but not evangelize these are the old laws that came back again came back again so babylon was a militarily powerful nation number 6 it was a very religious nation or religious culture it believed in the worship of many gods and goddesses and we think that india has many gods the ancient babylon had more gods or similar gods hundreds and thousands if not millions of gods and goddesses and there is a god for everything a god of the wood a god of the tree the god of current the god of this god of that a god for everything so they worship a pantheon of gods and goddesses and each city had a patron god and a temple every nook of the corner of the streets you'll find a small altar or a small temple and there is a god for that this was found in babylon i was shocked when i first went to nepal in 1986 at at the turn of every street and at the turn of even the corners of a street there is a small altar and the pious hindus in nepal they would reverently bow down and worship those gods and those altars and even feed them I saw a woman feeding rice to these idols. That's how religious they were. I saw what I saw in Nepal made me realize how the Babylonians would have been. Very, very religious people. And being religious, they had two kinds of practices. One, they practiced divination witchcraft and magic daniel chapter 1 verse 20 chapter 2 verse 2 verse 10 verse 27 chapter 4 verse 7 chapter 5 verse 7 and verse 11 in all the scriptures you'll find mention in the book of daniel about the religious background of the babylonians they practice divination witchcraft magic and they were soothsayers 
Soothsayers meaning they were prophesizing. So they prophesied. Besides that, they were also great in astrology. Astrology had its roots in Babylon. And again, you'll find them mentioned in Daniel chapter 1, verse 20, chapter 2, verse 2, verse 10, verse 27, chapter 4, verse 7, chapter 5, verse 7, verse 11, and verse 15. So they were very good in witchcraft, magic, divination, and astrology. They were the best brains. All the wisdom of astrology was born in Babylon. All the wisdom of witchcraft, magic, and soothsaying were born, had its roots in Babylon. So this ancient Babylon had many greats. One, it was a great commercial city. Secondly, it was a great military power. And thirdly, it was a great religious center. Now please remember this. It was a great commercial city. It was a great religious center. It was a great military power. When the Antichrist comes, he will similarly have three headquarters. One, a religious headquarter in Jerusalem. Secondly, a military headquarters in Berlin, Germany. And thirdly, a commercial headquarters in New Babylon 3. What it was in the past will once again repeat in the future. I say this based on the revelations the Lord gave me. Now, in the year 2016, the Lord had me go to Berlin and to do a prayer walk in Berlin. And during it was during the prayer walk, the Lord showed me the ancient spirits that were dwelling there in the city of Berlin and those ancient spirits that inhabited in Hitler and once again those same ancient spirits will re-emerge in the last days in the Antichrist. And subsequently, we went back again in 2017 to do a prophetic conference in Berlin and once again in this year, Next month, we will be in Berlin to do a prophetic conference because the Lord showed me what is going to happen quickly in Germany. So that's why he said, you need to go and do a prophetic conference and prophesy, speak over the city and raise up prophetic intercessors for the nation. You know, many things that are prophesied in the Bible, you cannot prevent them from happening. However, the consequences can be lessened. That we can do. Our prayers can do that. Our prayers can be mitigating factors to reduce impact of judgments or reduce the impact of the enemy's force coming upon the church. Now this ancient Babylon... Before the word Babylon came, it was called Babel. Genesis chapter 10 verse 10 tells us like that. And the founder of Babel, Genesis chapter 10 verse 8 says, is a man called Nimrod. I'm sure you have heard of this famous name, Nimrod, or infamous name. Now, who was Nimrod? The Bible tells this much of little information about him. Two things about him. Number one, he was the first king of the ancient world. First king. And a very powerful ruler on the earth. So he has or he had political power. Number one. Number two, he was a mighty warrior, a conqueror. So that tells us another thing about him. He had military power. So he was a powerful world leader, political world leader. Secondly, he was a mighty, mighty military leader 
who goes conquering. These are two things that says about him. And the another, another thing about him was, he was a, the scripture says he was a mighty hunter before God. In the original, in the original Hebrew it says, he was a mighty defiant person against God. So he was a very, very defiant man against the living God. So he stood for everything against God. So that led him to the next thing. He wanted to build a unified world city and a world at all tower. Genesis chapter 11 verse 4 tells us that. So what he attempted to do was to create the first new world order. That he was the first person to attempt that. A new world order where the whole world comes under his control and he will be the political leader over all and he will subdue all nations literally and bring them all under his control. And Babel will be the headquarters for the whole world. That's what he wanted to do. Secondly, the purpose of the tower. What was the purpose of the tower? Why constructing a tower can be such a bad thing? Okay, how, like, let's look at how the tower was built. If you read Genesis chapter 11 verse 3, the scripture says, they used burned brick cemented together with mortar made of bitumen. Now when you do, when you mix such composure, what results is a waterproof structure. Burn brick made with mortar, then bitumen applied all over. And do you know, that's the exact formula that God gave to Noah to build the ark. So what Nimrod attempted to do was, if God ever sent another flood, his city and his tower are waterproof. That was his attempt. I will withstand against whatever the Almighty will do. The Almighty cannot touch me, cannot touch my government, cannot touch my city. We are waterproof. But he forgot one thing. It was not fireproof. <laughs> he forgot. He forgot to make it fireproof, so God sent fire down instead of water. So, they built this tower. Now, how can a skyscraper be a bad thing? If you look at the world today, many nations of the world are competing with one another who is going to build the tallest skyscraper in the world. Just when the Dubai government thought they had built a huge skyscraper, have you seen it? Yeah. The Butch Towers. The Taiwanese people came to build the tallest skyscraper in the world, called the One Tower. See? One. Don't forget the word one. One world order. One world government. One world religion. One. Amazingly, that's what it was called, one. They all are competing with one another to build the tallest structure, like what Nimrod did. So if the tallest structures in the world today can exist, why destroy this poor guy's tower? During a, a conference that we did in Egypt in 2009, the Lord revealed to me that the real purpose why God destroyed the Tower of Babel because he was not merely building a strong skyscraper. What he attempted to do was to create a 
altar for the one world religion so his attempt was to build a huge tower to model or rival the pyramid in egypt the pyramid in egypt which was originally built by the prophet enoch was actually built as a place of altar to offer sacrifices unto god that's why if you visit the pyramid in giza the top portion is missing it's not a, a triangle shape on the top because the purpose was never to have a top it is supposed to be a seat where god comes to sit and to receive worship from all the people that were in the ancient times that was the purpose now now we i don't want to go into the great history of all that because that's not our purpose today so what was the pyramid nimrod modeled similarly after that to create an altar for the demons to come number 2 number 2 that altar the tower that he made was to become a portal when they were offering sacrifices that he'll create a portal for demons from the spiritual realm to come into the natural realm that was the real purpose of the tower of babel and that is why god destroyed it he destroyed the tower so that a portal cannot be created for demons to come through you know there is a purpose for everything that god does is mystery babylon real or imagery language used in the bible or does it really have significance in the last days there are many things in the bible that is used as a parable it's just an imaginary language that is used to convey a spiritual thing for example the bride of christ it's an imaginary language use that means it is the composed body of everybody so it signifies a bride a city or a nation is a signified as a woman like a lady we said she when we speak of a nation we say she are you sure, are you familiar with that so these are imaginary words used in the bible so now my question is or we need to answer this question is mystery babylon real or imagery or does it have any real significance in the last days let's look at a few facts number 1 the bible tells us in zechariah chapter 5 verses 5 to 11 that babylon will be rebuilt again in the last days in the year 2011 another prophet friend of mine and i we conducted a 3 days of prophetic conference in one small hill station in india and that was the very first prophetic conference where we ever televised live on our television network angel tv and uh, during one of the days this prophet friend saw a vision similar to what zechariah saw in zechariah chapter 5 similarly a swan carrying a basket and there was evil there he saw it exactly as how but he was not given any interpretation the that night the following day at 3 in the morning when i got up to pray i saw in an open vision on my bed i saw this vision an entire city been rebuilt and the interpretation for the meaning of zechariah chapter 5 was shown to me in exact in great detail how this was is brought to the land of shinar and then from shinar which is babylon how a world empire will come 
and then from the world empire the antichrist will rule the whole world so this is something that is prophesied about the future so it will be rebuilt number 2 the apostle john saw babylon rebuilt and thriving materialistically economically and militarily in revelation chapter 17 and chapter 18 he saw the future he was shown the future the whole book of revelation is about the future chapter 1 chapter 2 and chapter 3 were things that related to the past or present as he the lord told him i will show you things that must shortly come to pass that which was that which is and that which is to come so the past the present the future the condition of the seven churches were the past and the lord said this is the past and this is the present but from chapter 4 right up to chapter 22 they are all about the future nothing about the past anymore all future events so john saw future babylon rebuilt and was striving materialistically economically militarily and also religiously so in four fronts number 3 babylon will be a literal city not just an imaginary city or a spiritual city it will be a literal city revelation chapter 17 verse 1 says that it sits upon many waters and the angel who took john around to show all this he interprets it in verse 9 and verse 18 to say the many waters represents peoples so which means this is a city that is populated heavily populated by people so that tells us it is a real city and not an imaginary city number 4 as the governments of the world today make alliances and they sign treaties and covenants so likewise the world governments of tomorrow will make alliances sign treaties with her and also submit themselves to her revelation chapter 17 verses 10 to 13 number 5 this babylon will be a nation or a city given over to sexual vices which means the lbgt plus q r all the letters <laughs> they keep on adding you know first it was lgbt right then they added a q then they added another r and every now and then they have different different terms anyway so that's why we can keep it open a to z so the lgbt community will finally find a headquarters that will become their headquarters not only for the lgbt community but every manner of unimaginable sexual vices immorality will be found there have you heard of this small tiny wini nation called malta you know malta is one of the nation where the apostle paul had preached the gospel just a few months ago i made a shocking discovery that the president of malta or the government of malta had approved same sex marriage okay that's number 1 number 2 after the bill has come to uh, be effected the president went on a nation address to say he wants to dedicate malta to be full of gay people a nation of gays I decided to erase Malta from my memory. I don't want to think about Malta anymore. I was shocked. 
the president of the nation making the statement an entire nation like the former glory of Sodom and Gomorrah you know many years ago Haiti was destroyed by a massive earthquake before that happened do you know that the president of Haiti on the day of his inauguration stood on a podium lifted up his hand and he said I dedicate this nation to Satan these are all historical facts I'm not making up anything he, he made a public statement during his inauguration I dedicate this nation to Satan and Haiti is a nation given over to voodoo and witchcraft so it was wiped out so can you imagine what will happen to Malta next so when Babylon comes Malta will pale in comparison to Babylon number 6 Revelation chapter 17 verse 4 tells us that Babylon will be materialistically super rich she will be too rich with the goods of the world that all the nations will trade there today then Wall Street will become nothing just street <laughs> just street because the walls will be torn down it will be just street New York stock market will become nothing London stock market will become nothing the commerce of the world will be centered will gyrate towards Babylon Babylon will become the center for economic power number eight sorry seven she will be full of abominations what is that that is an amalgamation of all religions into one every religion take something of every religion put them together that is why the scripture says this woman mystery woman has a golden cup in her hand all made into one now it's one offering to everybody now I tell you some current news that is going to happen three years ago the Lord showed me which I have now made public that the present Pope is the false prophet you will heard that now and subsequently over the years the signs of him being the false prophet mentioned in Revelation 13 are coming to pass one by one this year he has made an announcement the announcement is the formation of one world religion and an invitation has been issued to all top religious leaders on the world to gather together September 2020 in the city of Hague in Holland at a place called the Peace Palace to sign the covenant of one world religion it's been set September 2020 and if the one religion comes to place and you know the coming of the Antichrist is just around the corner around the corner because this needs to come first the world needs to be united together with one religion then comes one nation then comes one economic power all will follow one after another one unified identifying number for everybody and we can all do transactions on the internet don't need to step out of your house anymore is it good? No. in a sense it's good 
but it's a trap. You don't even need to get out of your potato couch with a smartphone in your hand. You can do everything. See, good or bad? Good, good. You become fatter. You get fatter. You keep on eating potato in one hand and you have your mobile phone on your other hand. You know, even the TV industry, because I'm involved in television broadcasting, I know what's happening in the broadcast industry. There is a talk in the broadcast industry to shut down televisions and to migrate to internet. The, the, this talk first came out when we first started our television ministry in the year 2004. The people in the broadcast industry predicted tele television will die. This was 2004. Today, with the advent of internet broadcasting and the social media, television will die and all manner of videos or movies will all migrate to the internet. An experiment was done by all these powers to be through Netflix. Net How many of you have signed up for Netflix? Come on. Come on. I know you. Come on. Come on. Now, what's the convenience of Netflix? You don't need to go to the movie theater. The movie theater comes to your house. See? You don't need to get out from your potato couch. You sit there. The movie theater comes to you. Now, because of the success of Netflix, now Disney is going to embark on a similar route. And when, so when Disney made an announcement, Universal Studios, they made a similar announcement. Every one of the top movie industry producers have made announcements that they'll all migrate towards the internet. So, it's just in the palm of your hand with your mobile devices, your mobile smartphone, your iPad, your laptop. It's, it's, it's a media on the go. And it will all be controlled by the World Wide Web. And a new Wi-Fi code is coming, you know. And you know what's the amazing thing? They have a code for the new Wi-Fi. It's called number six. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't stop being amazed by the choice of the number. It couldn't have come at a more opportune time. That's a prophetic sign. I just read in a broadcast magazine that I used to get a new Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi six. That's the code. Why of all the numbers must be six? Right? See, the world is getting ready for the mark of the beast. Mark of the beast. The world is ready. Is the church ready? No. That's the problem. We are blind, deaf, and dumb. Be careful. Now, my stand is this. Many people ask me this question. So, I tell you today. My stand is, use technology as much as you can until... It will come to your hand. Yes. Then say no. Stop. Then stop. Use it as much as you want. You like. Because it's good. There are some good points in it. However, the catch is, don't become a slave to technology. Yes. You must learn to survive even without them. Yes. But today, people can live without food can live without water, but not live without Wi-Fi. <laughs> Don't laugh. You all are guilty of that. <laughs> Whenever you go to any new place, what's the first question you ask? <laughs> what's the password? <laughs> right? We are all guilty of that. Me too. Me too. I'm not a holy saint. I do the, 
<laughs> when I check into any hotel, the first question I ask, what's the password? <laughs> Some say, no password. See, I'm being honest with you. We are all slaves of technology. But don't become a bonded slave. Use technology. They are good things. Today, our studio is wireless and peopleless. It's all automated and the technicians don't need to be there physically. All fully automated. This is what the Lord told me in 2010. To migrate towards a fully automated. So every Saturday, we fast and pray. So all my staffs, 130 of them come together to fast and pray during the four hours that we are in prayer. No one is manning those equipment. They all run automatically. Of course, the angels are sitting there and look, making sure. <laughs> making sure all is moving perfectly. See, you, have, you become wireless and peopleless. And that's what the technology tomorrow will become. Have you heard of artificial intelligence? Yes. Take note of that. That is going to be a powerful tool in the hands of the Antichrist. Few years ago, you know, I was always fascinated by Revelation chapter 13. How is the false prophet going to cause life to come to a statue and the statue will speak, the statue will think, the statue will decide and the statue will act upon orders. How? So I thought maybe somehow he will have some magical powers and cause a wooden pole to become alive. If God can do that, maybe Satan can do that. Didn't God transform a wooden pole to become a cobra? Right? So I thought like that, you know. But a few years ago, to be exact, two years ago, I was meditating the scripture one evening, and I, when I read the scripture, and he will cause the statue to speak, and the Holy Spirit said, that is artificial intelligence. At that time, when I received this revelation, artificial intelligence was at its infant stage, and it, and it has not become full-blown like how it is today. Now I'll tell you something more interesting. Now in Revelation 13, it says, the false prophet will cause the statue to speak. Now the false prophet, I told you earlier, is the Pope, right? A few years ago, Vatican sponsored a World Congress on Artificial Intelligence. All the top brains in the world, they gathered together in Vatican to discuss about artificial intelligence. Why would Vatican be involved in that? Because it's something scientific, right? Why, why have a religious person be involved in that? Now that proves the power that he will use in the last days. And the artificial in intelligence is, get, is getting better and better and better. To what extent? To the exact extent as how we are. With the with plus plus features, which we do not possess. So that's what is going to go towards. How many of you have uh, iPhones? Now, when you send a message, before you type a word, the, the system itself will suggest to you those words, right? It makes typing easier. Now, what is that? Artificial intelligence. It reads what you regularly write. And then, it helps you by giving you all those words. Okay, these are the words you use regularly. Why do you use your brain? Don't use your brain. Let me help you. This is all artificial intelligence in its early stage. And it will become full-blown in the days to come. Number nine. Oops. 
Number eight. This shows me that all of you are alert. <laughs> it's 1.15 now. Shall I stop? No. Shall I continue? Yes. Okay. It won't be much longer. Number eight. Babylon will be a great military power. How do we know? Revelation chapter 17 verse 3 and 7 says, It is seated on a beast with seven heads and ten horns. And the seven heads and the ten horns, the angel interpreted to the apostle John as seven nations' governments. That will be, will be so militarily powerful that they will surrender their entire military power to the beast, to, the, to Babylon. So that Babylon becomes a military powerhouse. Something like NATO. NATO is a group of nations together that is formed to support one another, to fight for one another. Something like that. Number nine. New Babylon is anti-God and anti-Christians. And Revelation chapter 17 verse 6, chapter 18 verse 24 tells us that the new Babylon government will kill Christians. Christians will be killed, beheaded, churches bulldozed, close, godly, prophetic church leaders will be imprisoned, tried in court and even killed. So if you are not ready today for persecution, how can you survive? the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world. You must be prepared now. Persecution is coming. What do I do? Be strong in your faith. Be resolutely determined. No matter how much you are tortured, you will never renounce the Lord Jesus. You must prepare even your children and your grandchildren to be ready even for martyrdom. You know, during the seven days of fast that I, the Lord called me to, one of the subjects that he talked to me about is the worldwide persecution and martyrdom that is coming. So he said, I want you to go to seven nations next year and conduct Martyrs conference and prepare my people for what is coming. So among the seven nations, one is the US. So if God willing, we will do a martyrs conference in Cincinnati, Ohio next year. The dates, they are working out on the dates. I don't want that to clash with our conference. They are proposing in August. I don't want it to clash with our annual homecoming here. So, we must be prepared, not only you, but also your children. Because one way to get to the elders is through the children. You can be strong, but if the soldiers come and squeeze the neck of your children or your grandchildren, can any one of you just stand strong to see your grandchildren be squeezed to death? No. See, it's easy to say no now because you are not in the situation yet. But when you are in the situation, your emotions will run wild. It will take over you. And what will you do at that time? The greater tendency will be to save your grandchild, you will renounce. You will be greatly tempted to renounce. To prevent that from happening, you train your children now. That's why the Lord told me about seven years ago to prepare the children for martyrdom. So we have a special program on Angel TV called Warriors where I have a bunch of kids together with me and I teach them stories about martyrs. How the martyrs in the past have lived and then I teach them the principles of 
what we learned from the martyrs. And through that program, we have raised up an army of children martyrs today who have become so resolutely strong that no matter what happens, they will not take the mark of the beast. I have done that. So should you. Amen? Number 10. What is the real solid proof that this new Babylon is really real? There is one. Let me give you one final proof that this Babylon is not mystical, it is not spiritual, it is not allegory, but it is real. I'll give you two scriptures. Revelation chapter 17 verse 6 and chapter 18 verse 20. If you look at these two scriptures, please turn your Bibles with me now to Revelation chapter 17 verse 6. We will briefly look at these two scriptures. In 17.6 it says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Now look at the phrase there, blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Martyrs of Jesus did not exist in ancient Babylon. Because the Lord Jesus came in the New Testament. So, this is the first proof that this Babylon is not an ancient Babylon. Second proof, Revelation 18.20 Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Now look at the word apostles. They did not exist in ancient Babylon. Apostles existed in the New Testament. So, these two scriptures finally proves that this Babylon mentioned in the book of Revelation will be the future and is real. Amen? Amen. So, that concludes part one and tomorrow we will look at the spirit behind this. Why did John saw Babylon as a woman. Let's stand up for a word of prayer. Thank you, gracious Holy Spirit, for opening the eyes of our understanding that we may learn about this mystery Babylon. Thank you for giving us this understanding. Thank you for giving us this clarity that we may know what is coming in the days to come. And I ask you now, Spirit of the Living God, to prepare the hearts and the minds of each and every one of your dear sons and daughters who are gathered here and all those who are watching from afar. Prepare them, Lord. Prepare them. For it is not your desire that they be ignorant of all these things. And I pray the very special angel that you apportioned to them last night will guide them and enlighten them further on this. Just like you sent the angel to enlighten the Apostle John on the many things he saw about the book of Revelation. Thank you, Father. I commit your dear children into your hands. Let them have a wonderful, restful afternoon and also to meditate on all these things that they have heard in the first session and in the second session. And prepare them, Lord, to meet with you in the evening session. And let them have a wonderful breakthrough in their lives and an encounter with you in the evening session. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you everybody.